All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I believe it is just a little bit after 6.30, so we can get started. Uh, my name is Mark Rossetti. I am the Director of Operations and Special Events for the Historical Society. I want to thank you all for coming out on this wonderful, sunshiny evening we have uh, tonight. I suppose it is only fitting, as Joe said, for the uh, topic at hand. Uh, and the topic, of course, is Agnes, Can It Happen Again? Hurricane Agnes, the flood of 72, is... Uh, at the risk of making a really lame pun, a watershed moment. Everyone either measures time before the flood or after the flood. So it's only natural that you would uh, you know, want to look at it and think about you know, can and when will it happen again. Uh, history repeats, as we all know. So it's a natu natural thought progression. Uh, we would not be able to do this program and this exhibit, in fact, without the support of the Luzerne Foundation. So we want to thank them. Uh, they were able to provide us with a grant to do a lot of events and to film them all. As you can see, we are going to be filmed today. We're going to have this in our collection. We're going to have a DVD made of this. So it's going to be wonderful. Uh, but, and likewise, uh, one last shameless plug before we start the program. Saturday, Dr. Newell, our executive director, will be doing a gallery talk in this very room on the paintings you see around you, Saturday at 2 o'clock. So if you're looking for something else to do this week, come on down. It's a pretty good lecture. Now, so without further ado, you don't want to hear me talk. I will introduce our panelists. First, on the far side of the table is Chris Bellman. He's the executive director of the Luzerne County Flood Protection Authority. In the center, we have Dr. Brian Whitman, who is a environmental engineering professor, amongst many other things, at Wilkes University. And then uh, here, uh, immediately to uh, my right, is Kathy Lang uh, from the Steamtown National Historic Site, the curator from the Steamtown National Historic Site who has a rather interesting window into things as she was uh, working in a museum setting in New Orleans when a little storm called Katrina hit. Uh, so the way this is basically going to work is the panelists will each have 10 to 15 minutes roughly. Uh, you know, can it happen again? Yes, no, why, why not? Uh, and then once that is all over, the second half will be questions from you, the audience. So uh, while you're listening to them, think of your questions and uh, be ready. And so with that, Chris, I believe you drew the first straw, so if you would please, sir. Well, Mark, uh, thank you for inviting me to be a participant in this panel, and, and thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. Uh, but I think before we answer the question or start looking at the question, can Agnes happen again, I think it's very important to kind of look back at how well the flood protection system started in the Wyoming Valley. Uh, the Susquehanna River is one of the most flood-prone uh, waterways in the nation. In fact. Uh, on a national level, uh, when you look at the total flood losses across the nation, 10% 10, 10 of that number it comes from the Susquehanna, Susquehanna River watershed. It's a, it's a huge number. Uh, but af after the floods of 1936, uh, lo local officials, they petitioned the federal government for uh, a flood protection assistance. And shortly thereafter, the levy started to be erased uh, here in the Wyoming Valley. It was uh, interrupted by the World War II, but essentially uh, at the end of the Second World War, uh, you know, there was levy systems in, uh, Plymouth, uh, in Exeter, Edwardsville, uh, 44 Sawyersville, uh, and Wilkes-Barre, Han Hanover. And at that time, each municipality maintained their own uh, portion of the flood protection systems. Like Han Han Hanover Township, they maintained their portion of the flood protection system. The city of Wilkes-Barre maintained theirs, Plymouth theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kingston maintained uh, Kingston and Edwardsville and Luzerne County maintained you know, 440 stories well, and there's about a mile up in Exeter. And that's the way that it existed up, up, up until uh, the Agnes flood. And then at that time, uh, you know, Tropical Storm Agnes, it, it overwhelmed the existing flood protection system, and the valley was absolutely destroyed. It was a catastrophe. Uh, and then after that, the local officials again petitioned for, uh, for, you know, for additional assistance to raise the level of protection in the Wyoming Valley. And, uh, uh, and the Wyoming Valley Levy Racing Project, which occurred essentially from the, the mid-90s to early two, 2000s, uh, it raised the level of protection in the valley, you know, three to five feet. And as a, an element of that project, uh, you know, the Corps of Engineers, they wanted to have a, a single en entity who was responsible for the operation and maintenance of the entire system. They were concerned about the haphazard approach that the, that the municipalities were taking to their maintenance. You know, some municipalities did very good, and others, they essentially, they, uh, they neglected. Uh, their portion of the, the levy. So they were looking for a single entity. And that's when the, the Flood Protection Authority was created. We executed a project cooperation agreement with the federal government. 
and we are responsible for the operation, maintenance, repairs, replacement of the entire system. Uh, now in September of 2011, uh, we had Tropical Storm Lee, which was an even greater event than the, Ag than the Agnes flood. So to answer your question, can Agnes happen again? Absolutely. But the important thing is here uh, is that the flood protection system held. It performed very, very well. It got some uh, bruises, but because uh, the authority maintains the system in such good condition, we were able to take advantage of, uh, uh, of it's called Public Law 84-99. It's uh, like if there's a, a damage to a federal flood protection system because of a, a flood or a, a natural event like that, since we do maintain it in good protection, in, in good maintenance, that, it's, that, that the federal government will pick up all, all the costs for the, for, the, for the repairs and replacement. And, and that's what occurred in 11. So we, uh, we sustained about $2 million in damage to the system and the federal government picked up the entire tab. Um, so the, so the, to answer your, your question, you know, the, the, the existing flood protection system, which is, which is now a 16-mile flood protection system, it, 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 it sustained stresses greater than it was designed for. But, but the important thing is, is that it performed very well, it held. But if there comes a flood event that is greater than Lee, you know, the system is going to be overtopped. And in the Wyoming Valley, the, my, my big fear is that people are complacent. It's been 45 years since the Agnes flood, six years, going on seven years since Tropical Storm Lee, people are complacent, and, and they shouldn't be. You know, it's, you know, the threat of risk along the river has, has increased, and, and people need to be aware of that, and they need to be prepared. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Dr. Whitman? Well, the, the question is, can it happen again? As Chris said, it has happened again with Lee, but we had a, a higher levee system that held back the waters. So if you analyze the Agnes itself and look at the storm, this is probably what I can talk about. You look at the path that came up through the Gulf, came up along the coast, strengthened off of New York, and what it did is it came inland, went over the top of us once, and then looped back and went over us again. So Agnes actually went over us twice, if you look at the path. And so what that created was the flood as we know. And then Lee really was preceded by Irene. So when you look at Lee, that also was effectively a double storm. So what does a double storm mean? It means the first event that comes through gets everything wet, infiltration rates are very, slow, are very low, everything's filled up, storage is already filled up, so when the second event hits, there's nowhere else for the water to go. So what we do is we try to manage that along the river. We try to get the water in the river, the Susquehanna River as best we can, hold back tributaries, there's a number of stormwater dams along the Susquehanna River, none of them in the river itself, to try to clear out the channel. And then when that flood wave goes by, we allow the tributaries to drain. So it's a really complicated system, and we have to monitor that continuously to manage that, okay? To allow the water to release, to get it through, and protect as much as we can with that kind of system. So with the increased amount of developments in the watershed that we're doing. We're increasing the amount of impervious areas. What that does is it drives more water to the channels. And so when we do have these big events, they are bigger and they continue to get bigger unless we learn to manage the stormwater at the source. And so probably for the last 15 years, there's been a lot of strategies to do that. So we try to retain the water at the source, allow it infiltrate into the ground itself, recharge the groundwater, but that, those strategies are slow to come. And then the other question I always get is, because of climate change, is that going to be an issue? Well, that's still being discussed and being looked at. The problem with doing this kind of analysis is every year I get another data point to analyze how big the events are. So if you look at the Agnes flood itself and the actual rainfall across the watershed, the eastern part of the watershed didn't get nearly as much rainfall as the west. So some could argue that only half of the watershed 
really flooded. In the west, we had some rain gauges that had 12 inches. In the east, we had some rain gauges that had three. If you take the average over the entire watershed, it was about six inches of rain, which comes out in this area to be about the 100-year storm event. So we would expect something like Agnes once every about 100 years or so. But when you analyze the flood and look at the frequency of that particular flood, you have to look at how that water got to that point. And so the Agnes flood, when you do the statistics, should be about the three to 400 year flood. So the 100 year storm event created the 400 year flood event. Why? Because it went over us twice. Okay? But then we had Lee, Irene and Lee, which certainly wasn't 400 years after Agnes. So the question is, why did we get another event that was even bigger than Agnes in terms of flow rate before 400 years? Part of it is with more impervious areas that we've been adding. We're still trying to manage how we deal with storm events across this. But it also could be an indication of more water falling overhead. Or maybe it was just a freak, freak event. We won't see it again for another hundred some years. But the fact is, at some point, we will see it again. And if it is bigger than Lee, it will top. So if you ever want to see, get an indication of what that flood might be, is if you go along the levee system across from Wilkes University, there's a whole bunch of benches there. Okay, it's by the gateway off of Franklin Street. I love those benches. Because if I sit on that bench, and look at the levee and just sit straight like this, I could see the trees right over the top of the levee. That's where the water will be when it tops over. So when I turn around, do a 180, and look across the city, I could see all the buildings. I'm on the second floor of all those buildings by the levee system. So when it does happen, it will be bigger than Agnes. Okay? So we just have to be prepared for that. So what can we do to even make it, well, we could keep building the levee, right? Well, we can only make them so big if we want to, right? So the question is, it's not so will it happen again, it's more of when it will happen again, and when it does happen again, it's gonna be bigger than we've ever seen with Agnes, at least in my opinion. Now, if it breaks through the levee at a lower level because of the hydraulic stresses, maybe not. But if it tops over, it will be a very large event. Okay? So I am still analyzing the Lee, Irene Lee event. That too, in terms of flow rate, it's a little bit larger than uh, what we saw with Agnes, but it's in the same range in terms of size of flow rate through the system. But again, Irene and Lee, those are 50, 75, 100 year storm events, but there were two of them. First one got everything wet, increased, everything was stored that could be stored. So when Lee went overhead, there was nowhere else for the water to go. That's where we get the big flood. And so when I was watching that system occurring, when I was at Wilkes University at the time, I was trying to determine what to do for the department. I started evacuating the department one day before everybody else because I was watching the system and I understood what was happening. And I was able to get a lot of my equipment up to the top floors with the elevator, because the day when they called for the evacuation, the elevators were all jammed. I was able to help other people. Okay? So I'm prepared for that. And I think the city and every community should be prepared for that too. Thank you. Kathy, your thoughts? Um, I've only been up here about a year and a half, so I don't have any experience with Agnes at all, but I was at Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve in New Orleans when Katrina hit, and a lot of lessons learned, and um, I'm kind of speaking from the museum side of things, but there were a lot of other things that we learned, you know, evacuating. The roads were so backed up that people were sitting on the 26-mile bridge and weren't moving at all. 
as Katrina was bearing down. So everyone thought that this was gonna be another hurricane, we leave, we'll be back in two days, and that didn't happen at all. And um, so, you know, we learned a lot about preparation because also everyone thought if it hit, it wasn't going to be such a widespread experience, and it was. The National Guard that everyone was plan, you know, waiting on and hoping they would help, they were washed out. Their vehicles were underwater. They couldn't use them. That was um, just one of the things. But I know for us at the park, we had a disaster plan. Well, our disaster plan was based on other museums in the city helping us out. And all, of course, all of them were also in the same boat as we were. And um, the flooding happened in various parts of the city. Some places were a little drier than others, depending on how high they were. The um, art museum in the city park, they were up on sort of a knoll, so they, were, they stayed dry. However, they had people in the museum with guns guarding against looting. And um, the stories that their security officer was telling us were kind of scary, but that was another thing that people were worried about is looting. You know, and there were like the Tulane University, their archives flooded, everything in their archives was damaged. It was on a ground floor, some of it, we don't have basements in New Orleans, it's just a little too low, below sea level. But um, Tulane pretty much lost all their archives. And they were lucky that they had people from outside the state come in with trucks, um, freezer trucks, to help them with their materials. We, um, most of our storage for museum objects was in our French Quarter Visitor Center. Now, that building didn't sustain any damage, but because there was no electricity, um, there was no way to, you know, keep the storage area at a lower temperature. There was also no security, and so that was a big issue as well. So they, we have what's called a Museum Emergency Response Team, MERT. Actually, it was for, cure, you know, for the museum objects. So we had a group come in from the Northeast. They came down, and they pretty much took over what we were doing with the museum collection, which was a good thing because, you know, they had contacts that they could get materials, they could get services to come in, and that was really important, and that was something I couldn't have done. So, and that was just another, you know, uh, important thing. But ever, after Katrina, we rewrote our disaster plan so that we could look for storage spaces that would be with outside 100 miles at least, and storage places, different kinds of transportation. Um, it, was, it, was important, it was an important lesson because we were pretty much stuck, as a lot of the other museums were as well. And um, as I said, a lot of lessons learned. The, the city was also under curfew. And it was also that you couldn't even get into the city without certain credentials. And luckily, we had the park police that could get credentials. So they were able to get us into the park to try and save artifacts as best we could. And we not only had a French Quarter Visitor Center, we had Chalmette Battlefield for the Battle of New Orleans. We had um, a natural area in the swamp area. And um, in our Chalmette Visitor Center was so damaged it had to be torn down. When we went there, they broke down the door, they pulled out most of the artifacts, and they sent them immediately to be conserved. And um, we were lucky with that, because it, any longer than what we had, they probably would have all been ruined. And, um, and that was pretty sad. We also were able to go in and save records and pretty much everything else was gone. The power of water is amazing, how it just tears everything apart. And um, so that was significant at our Chalmette site. Now our natural history area basically su just sustained wind damage, lost a lot of trees. You couldn't even get into the site because of all the trees down. 
So it was with Katrina, there was damage in different areas, but it was all very serious damage. And as I said, we learned a lot of lessons. And so we, you know, we began to start evacuating earlier because most people, as I said, went home on the weekend and thought we'd be back Monday, it didn't happen. So um, we had a lot of more things in place, evacuating earlier, starting to put things up higher before, well beforehand. We had it planned out. If we had to move artifacts from one place to another, we could do that earlier. The, um, the collections that we had in the uh, French Quarter, the team that came down decided it was best to move them all to a place in Natchez, Mississippi, which we did. Uh, $10,000 for the move, 10000 to bring them back. But they thought it would be safer there because, as I said, there was no security in the French Quarter. And um, our park police, however, was a little scary. When they took me into my house to help, you know, so that I could get some things out, you know, they were like, stay in the van. I'm like, okay. And then they jumped out with their guns, and one was at one end and the others were at the other end because they were so afraid of people with guns, and um, which they should have been if you had seen all the signs, you know, you loot, I shoot, that kind of a thing. So it was kind of a wild west for a while. And um, as I said, we learned a lot of lessons. So we, you know, I come, I've been up here and I've rewritten our disaster plan here because flooding can happen after a fire, flooding can happen with the river you know, all kinds of things can happen, and um, we want to be prepared. And I know in the Lackawanna County, they put together a group, and most of the museums have met to talk about doing disaster plans. And we're going to follow up in a meeting in a couple weeks to discuss how our plans have gone. So that um, is one good step, I think. But lots of things can happen, and it's much better to be prepared. And as I said, when it happens, not will it happen. And, um, you know, because Louisiana has been hit by several floods since then, since Katrina. And um, you just, you have to be ready. And you have to look much farther than just your little community. So... Just before we open it up for questions, I want to get one more comment from the panel. And Chris made a good point that I thought was interesting. You mentioned complacency going forward. Now, since obviously, you know, it's a matter of when, not if, what do you feel is the biggest issue going forward? And then how would you potentially rectify that? Okay. Uh, after, after Tropical Storm Lee, uh, FEMA tasked the United States Army Corps of Engineers to uh, update the hydraulic model of the Susquehanna River, essentially a 100-mile reach from mm -hmm. uh, the city of Sunbury up to uh, Luzerne County's border with uh, Lackawanna County. And what they found was that you know, the flood risk has increased. I mean, uh, the base flood elevation has increased from a half a foot to essentially four, four feet. And this can be attributed to a global warming. We're seeing more frequent and intense storms. There's been increased development in the, the watershed, so runoff gets to uh, uh, the river very quick, quickly. Uh, and w what that means is that uh, FEMA is going to revise the fell insurance rate maps, which is, uh, you know, the regulatory maps, uh, the flood, flood insurance is based on them. Uh, you know, they, they just released the very, very pre preliminary uh, firm maps for our area. But it'll, it'll be a few more years before the maps become effective and they become regulatory. But what's important is that uh, communities learn how to be uh, resilient, because we know we, we have this uh, flood risk here in the valley. It's important that communities learn how, how to be resilient. And what, what does that mean? That means communities need to be prepared. They need to have their communities designed so that they can absorb the shock of a major flood. And they have to be uh, designed such that they can rebound quickly from a major flood event. And uh, some of the things that communities can do, they can have a very strong uh, floodplain ordinance. Uh, strong building codes. Uh, they can uh, do mitigation in, in their communities. Uh, you know, for for homes that are located in in the, the floodplain, you know, they can you can fill in the basement, get utilities raised. Uh, buildings can be acquired, demolished. Uh, there are a number of mitigation techniques that a community can use, and you know, in, in in their toolbox to become more resilient. Brian, what do you feel is the 
big issue going forward? I think people have a short memory. You know, they're very, very happy when the levy is there when it needs to be there. And they're okay with fees and thinking about it. And then after a year, okay it seems like... <laughs> they're never okay with the fee. <laughs> For that first year, I think they are. <laughs> but I think then they start going, ah, we don't need it. Same with a lot of infrastructure. We don't want to pay for that. We just want it to be there, it seems like, a lot of times. So when you're dealing with water resources economics, you're looking at trying to fund these projects, major, major expensive projects using public funds. It's always going to be an interesting dialogue and arena to go into to get those projects done. There's a lot of thought that it's waste. And, oh, well, it may seem that way until you need it, and then you're very grateful for it. You know, I deal many times with the thought that, why do we have all these stations along the river monitoring the water levels and all? Why do we need to fund that year after year? I hear this from Congress people sometimes. And I have to tell them, look, when the flood comes, we've got to have everything ready to go. We can't just stop funding some of these infrastructure projects and pieces thinking that when it's coming, then we'll pay for it. It's too late. You've got to have it ready to go. That data coming from those stations are going into the hydraulic model, making, helping us making decisions on how to save as many people's lives and property as possible. And so, yeah, it costs money. We need to continue to fund these projects and fund these monitoring systems. Okay. But you're dealing with public money and taxes, and I understand. So, yeah, you got to keep doing it. If you think about the fee, it's really compared to losing your home, it seems modest to me. So. Kathy, your thoughts on the future? Well, I, I kind of agree. You know, you have to be prepared. And um, if you look at what happened in New Orleans, how many people were rescued off their roof or pulled out of buildings. And, you know, Fats Domino, who was rescued from his house even. But, you know, and the whole business with the evacuation and getting that all set up and have it there and have people know about it. I mean, there were supposed to be buses that took people out because so many people didn't own vehicles, and that broke down. I mean, many things that should have worked didn't work because nobody thought it would happen. And I think things like that need to be set up and, and taken seriously. Yeah, just, the management plans are, are really critical um, and, and practicing. And um, so, one of the books I contributed to is Emergency Management for in, Emergency and Security Management for Water Systems. And one of the things that we tend to do is we make a plan, we put it in a binder, we put it over there by the door, and there it sits. We don't practice, we don't review it, we don't think about it. And so after we had a, uh, the 9-11 that took place, there was all this activity to look at emergency plans and stuff. And they invited me into some of these committees and everybody, all they wanted to do was rewrite the plan, but they never thought about practicing the plan. And so if you really want to be prepared, it's one thing to have the binder by the door that tells you what to do, but you don't have time to go run and read that binder when the disaster is hitting. So you got to practice, you got to rehearse it. And I think that's where a lot of communities probably fall short. I mean, in schools, we're supposed to do fire drills and stuff, right? But we don't do a lot of these emergency management plans until the disaster or the, or the emergency hits. And that'll be, that's tough to deal with from a community level. But even from a residential home, I do this with my kids. If there's something, you know where to go, they know the tree, they know how to get out of the house through multiple ways. And yeah, we practice that. Okay? So practice whatever your plan is. Don't just think about it. Actually practice it and execute if you can. 